All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Prep Tech Talk powered by NAPSIC Foundation titled The Future is Now, Building Robust, Effective, and Sustainable Data Practices and Partnerships for the Next Generation of the Highfeld Community. I'm Kevin Kay from NAPSIC Foundation, and I will be your facilitator today. Really quickly, some background logistics. Due to the large attendance, all participants are muted for the duration of the session. So please use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your Zoom tab for questions that are relevant to the whole group. If you put your questions in chat, they won't appropriately go to the presenters. Uh, we will also address these Q&A questions throughout the webinar, and we'll pause at the end to answer any additional questions. A copy of the slides associated links and the recording of this webinar will be provided on the NAPSIC Foundation website. We'll also have a couple polls that will pop up, and so those should automatically appear on your screen. An agenda to guide us today so you know where we're going. We're gonna do a quick introduction about the presenters and NAPSIC Foundation and also the audience. Then we'll jump over to the Highfeld team with Julie, Kosti, and Matthew. And then finally, we'll do any additional questions and answers. Briefly, if you haven't been on a Prep Tech Talk before or heard about NAPSIC Foundation, we are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 2005. And really who we are is the 20,000 plus public safety officials, operators, and GIS staff. Those are mostly based in the US, but we also have stakeholders across the globe. And really what we do is strive to provide all of our training tools, best practices, and other resources at no cost to the public safety community. And our mission is, you could see here, is really to advance the geospatial technology and capabilities for the public safety community. And that is done in conjunction with them based on actual operational gaps. We foster adoption of the tools, best practices, mainly for daily operations and disasters. We want to make sure that they're usable every day and for the big events. And then finally, we bridge the gaps across agencies and disciplines to ensure that local jurisdictions can share their best practices with other jurisdictions that need help and different disciplines can share what they've learned on incidents. We do this mainly through defining and promulgating best practices, and that comes out as national guidelines and standards. What we're really excited about are exercises and simulations that we provide. And those are through no fault sandboxes where you can test the tools, try them out yourselves and not break anything hopefully. We also provide a bunch of videos, education and training so you can implement the tools and technology we work on in your own organization. And finally, we do limited tech assistance with transferring knowledge and skills. But that's enough about us. What about you who are on the call today? So we have a total of 203 participants who signed up. As you can see, they're all across the country and some across the world. So hello to you in the UK and our friends out in Hawaii. Uh, we have a large contingent of emergency management and fire service stakeholders, but also a good mixture of law enforcement, 911, and other public safety disciplines. So with that, we want to know a little more about the audience and how you use the Highfeld data. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. So you should see the poll show up on your screen now. So we want to know how often you interact with the Highfeld data, how you typically interact with it, what do you typically use Highfeld data for, and what are the data sets you would like Highfeld to prioritize? And we'll give folks a minute to answer the poll.
All right, last 30 seconds, I can see we got about 20 folks who are still entering the poll data. All right, I'll go ahead and end the poll. All right, so as folks can see, uh, we have a good mixture, but it looks like the winner is yearly or as updates are available for how folks interact with the high failed data. Um, we also see a lot of folks working on it on a daily or weekly basis. For how people typically interact with it, um, we have a good amount who download the data or use it as a REST service. That's great. So they could get automatic updates. What do we typically use HiFel data for? Uh, it looks like a lot of people using it to augment their own data with missing information or for specific projects. We also have a lot of people using it as the best available data for large geographic areas. And finally, which data sets would you like HiFel to prioritize? Clear winner, critical infrastructure, water, energy, and those data sets. So thanks for everyone for uh, submitting their poll answers. So with that, I would love to hand it over to Julie, Julie Sokol and Kosti Tudon from uh, the Office of, or the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency and the Office of the Chief Information Officer, Julie. Thanks so much, Kevin. We really appreciate being here today. And that was exceptionally useful information in the poll. So well, uh, I think the material we have for you is very appropriate for this audience. But of course, there's the Q&A uh, that will help fill any, any gaps for you today. So feel free to use the Q&A. And if we don't get to it throughout this particular segment, then we'll, we'll have time uh, to address any questions from there. Uh, so I'm Julie Sokol. I am the new program manager for the new Highfield program under DHS. That's under the Geospatial Management Office, which is actually under the Chief Data Officer, which is under the Chief Information Officer at headquarters. And uh, Kosti, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I was going to say good afternoon and joke about the Pacific Coast time, but then I saw the map with all of the dots all over the, and I don't know what to say. Good day. <laughs> um, so yes, my name is Kosti Tudon. I work in the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, our office, the Chief Data Office, is inside of the Chief Technology Officer. Um, team and uh, we worry about data governance and about data quality and the policy that governs uh, all of the data aspects in our agency. Um, by way of introduction, I've been you know in this field for a long time and early in my career I actually as a consultant I worked with some of um, you know the local government folks uh, in West Tennessee. I don't know if there's any people out from Memphis in the audience here, but I used to live in Memphis and I worked with a lot of folks in, in that area and in the state of Tennessee. I was probably one of the first people on the Tennessee Geographic Information Council. So I, it's uh, good to be back and working with uh, some of you folks. Um, I know that a lot of the uh, folks in this uh, organization probably work with CISA or our previously uh, named NPPD organization. Um, you know, you're probably working through the stakeholder engagement division um, from our agency, as or the infra, uh, or the um, uh, operations division, integrated operations division. Uh, but we, as our name says, uh, you know, we worry about cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. We actually had a pretty busy uh, few days uh, with all the elections and such. Uh, lately, but uh, you know, we kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Um, yesterday, everything went smoothly. So um, I'm here to support uh, the high field uh, as the program has moved over to DHS and support Julie in my capacity as co-chair of the uh, high field uh, subcommittee. Uh, so Julie and I share that responsibility. And uh, you know, in uh, CISA, we do a lot of work uh, for uh, emergency response, uh, we have the National Risk Management Center. Uh, you know, for example, we do work on um, 
uh, response during emergencies such as uh, hurricane uh, emergency response. And we use the high field information, high field data, you know, to produce uh, maps and uh, data for decision makers um, throughout the planning stages or during the response itself. So we have a vested interest in making sure that we have good quality data and the high field data. So uh, I'm, I'm here to support uh, that aspect of uh, the new program. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Julie and she's gonna go over the high field slides. Yeah, thanks so much, Kosti. And thanks for making time to be here this busy week and everyone else. Uh, we were going to have Matt Barasa, who's um, GMO director, uh, to make an appearance here, um, but it's uh, we'll, we'll see if he's able to join. Uh, but what we want to start from is the transition, the program transition for Highfeld. It's sort of in its natural home now over at Homeland Security. And uh, with the partnership with CISA, uh, co-chairing the subcommittee, it's we've got that great foundation um, on infrastructure requirements and perspective. So um, we're really excited about the program transition. And we'll, um, within this briefing, we'll talk a little bit about the history for a small percentage who um, were not familiar with Highfield. And then we'll get to um, the important stuff, the updates and the things uh, that you need to know as users of the data. So uh, without further ado, um, we just wanted to give you a sense of where the Highfield program is landing. So within the Geospatial Management Office, there are a few different responsibilities that we have. Uh, one of them is to manage uh, what's called the Geospatial Information Infrastructure, which uh, may be a familiar term to you. It's an ESRI-based portal that's available to the Homeland Security Enterprise uh, for geospatial applications and data coordination. So the GMO supports the GII. We also support the Enterprise Licensing Agreement uh, for ESRI across DHS. Uh, and we also uh, have do some governance activities. We facilitate the Highfield Subcommittee, which um, Kosti and I are co-chairing, but also a DHS specific geospatial working group, not to be confused with the FEMA GWG. Uh, this one is um, positioned out of headquarters and, and looks at GDA compliance and component coordination. Uh, we also support data integration, situational awareness. Uh, we sponsor the COP program uh, that's um, out of uh, DHS operations. And then of course, uh, there's community engagement. So we have a lot of self-service tools, applications. Uh, we are the connector. We're kind of the pass-through for a lot of uh, coordination, either across levels of government or across the components. And so we use that role to capture and elevate best practices, to uh, do our best to stay current with various communities to keep everybody connected. And so Highfield is fitting into this framework um, in a really exciting way. So we'll talk more about that. The next slide. All right, so just a quick step back in time. What is Highfield? Highfield, uh, you could describe it as three things. It's a, definitely a geospatial data inventory that many of you use. Uh, we're up to about 500 critical infrastructure layers. We're also a longstanding community of users. Highfield has been around for 20 years now in some capacity, and we're doing our best to make sure it's around for 20 more uh, with the emerging requirements from users. And Highfield is also a governance body, a subcommittee under the FGDC. That's the Federal Geographic Data Committee and that uh, we coordinate geospatial data requirements across the Homeland Security Enterprise. So just wanted to give you that picture for those of you um, new to this topic in the next slide. Then a little more of a history lesson. Uh, we just wanted to point out um, the high points of the evolution of Highfield. So, um, and some of you were around for the, be the very beginning in 2002. It was after 9-11 where uh, various agencies came together and said, we need a common data repository. And so they formed the working group, I uh, called it Highfeld, and uh, it grew from there. And so uh, now we have the data inventory. Um, as many of you know, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency housed the program in the early years, uh, just until DHS was ready to receive a program uh, to manage it. So Starting from about, I think, 2008, 2009, the program started with NGA 
and then partnered with DHS to disseminate the data. So NGA had all the responsibilities to procure and, and review it, and then DHS would receive and then share it back out. And so uh, it took a long time, <laughs> the speed of government, uh, to get uh, to where we are today, which is transferring all program authority and the resources over to DHS GMO. And in the meantime there, we had some great wins. We transitioned from the static DVD, a delivery that went out once a year to dynamic delivery on two separate platforms. One is Highfield Open, uh, which we partner with the Department of Interior on the GEO platform uh, to share out Highfield Open layers. And uh, about 75% of the Highfield inventory is on Highfield Open. The rest of it, Highfield Secure, those are licensed and FOUO layers, those are on the GII and they require a HISN account to access. So now this transition has occurred. It's all here under the GMO. Our near-term focus um, in our new home is to focus on requirements, to improve the data, and to streamline delivery across the board. So we'll get to more of those details in a moment. Next slide. All right. So. The way forward for data acquisition, this is a hot topic. We currently are maintaining the, um, anything that NGA procured for the high field inventory, we are still able to share out. Uh, that's um, what we're referring to as the legacy inventory, but it's still current. It's still um, being shared out, but we are in the process. We actually started back in spring of 2022 to review the current requirements of that inventory. What's still valid? what's no longer needed and what unmet requirements should we be looking at. And so those discussions and, the, and that activity is uh, really happening in the Highfield subcommittee right now, which has representation from federal, federal agencies and also state and local entities um, under FGDC. So we know that we need uh, to establish a requirements mechanism, something that is available to all uh, for example, the venue here, we just saw in the poll what um, particular requirements are, what data you're using. And so that's something we're going to use and put into our requirements tracking uh, so that we're um, building off of these um, venues to understand requirements better. And the other aspect of our data acquisition, of course, is a contract. Uh, we had to start from scratch with the resources coming from NGA to establish a brand new contract uh, that's on a DHS strategic sourcing vehicle. It was awarded uh, not too long ago, just right at the end of the fiscal year. And uh, the name for it is the GDCIS, that's the Geodata Collection and IT Services a contract. And that will serve to scout, manage, and procure data uh, based on the requirements that come out of the Highfield subcommittee. And so since it's the first year for both the program under DHS and the contract, uh, we wanna be really, really clear and open about uh, how we're interacting with potential suppliers. So we want to have an open door policy. Uh, we plan to have uh, several industry days over the coming months to engage with vendors in a very transparent way. And this will allow new faces as well as established vendors to start with the same information so that we can understand current and emerging requirements. We're also uh, developing criteria, and this is something that will be approved by the Highfield subcommittee. This is criteria um, for some of the, uh, that will help mitigate some of the issues that we've seen with the Highfield inventory over time. Uh, so for example, uh, we want to look at um, the delivery methods and the cadence and the quality of the data as well as the metadata coverage. We would like to get eventually the high field inventory all to the same consistent place uh, with those factors. And so in, in terms of cadence, uh, we have recognized that having quarterly updates is probably too often and it can create some chaos when some layers are being updated quickly and others are not being updated and you as the user have to figure out you know, what, when's this going to be updated or if it is, and, and uh, we're kind of forcing those management issues on you. And what we want to do is get the inventory into that consistent place. So we're planning on a twice a year cadence 
for data updates, which I'll talk about more shortly. And we've also recognized uh, the need to spot fix some of the layer. So for example, when particular data points uh, need to be updated, uh, perhaps you know, a, a hospital has closed or changed names or something, uh, we need to have the uh, channel uh, set with the data providers to where that can be addressed quickly so that you're not having inaccurate data in your viewers and applications. So that's another aspect to our intake criteria um, that we're looking at. And then of course, there's um, the big issue of licensing and usage constraints, which uh, I know has been a, a big topic with um, the NAPSIG community here. So we're making sure that potential suppliers through our market research and industry days will understand our goals in having the same sheet of music for all users across different levels of government. So our goal, our very lofty goal, um, but courageous goal is to get the best data that serves all of our missions the best. And uh, we're just starting out on that journey. So I'm just gonna pause here and be true to um, stopping for any Q and A or questions yeah, that might be. Julie, I was going to stop you here because there's a couple of questions uh, relevant to this slide. I think you kind of addressed one of them, but I'll ask it anyway. Sure. Um, you know, when will the high field uh, next update some of the data layers that are subject to more frequent change, like transportation and points of interest? And then the other question is, will the user community get to provide input to the data requirements, or will that only come from the subcommittee? Yeah. Uh, well, let me just do the, the second question first. We want uh, people to be able to get their requirements into the subcommittee. And that, uh, that second bullet there, that requirements mechanism, uh, has to be established so that you are able to come to the Highfield program directly with your requirements. Uh, we would then, uh, if, if you have representation on the subcommittee, we would connect you with that member to help facilitate that request. Uh, or if you don't have representation, then that's something we would look to address. And, and um, Kosti and I, as co-chairs to the subcommittee, are looking at how to um, revamp our membership roster so that it, it includes everybody and people have a clear way to convey their requirements. So right now, it's kind of the old-fashioned way where um, we'll have our email address here, the Highfeld support team email address, or me directly. Please reach out. We uh, um, are in the habit of going in, and meeting and capturing that information and feeding it into our um, backup material for the subcommittee, and then it goes in front of them. So that's currently how it is, but we want to have a more transparent and perhaps automated way for you to convey that information going forward. But for the time being, uh, we can work with you to identify who your uh, subcommittee member is, um, or we can work with you directly and, and look into that kind of representation. Does that help for that second question? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure that we okay. get, uh, you know, um, I, right, I don't yeah. see, unless they type in the chat, I don't see the anything, uh, any reaction. Uh, the good, other question good, was good about- Good answer, um, Julie. Okay, good. <laughs> excellent. Thanks. Yeah, the other question was about uh, uh, when will the next update be, but I think you addressed a little bit, you know, when you talked about cadence and spot fixing, but, uh, do you have any idea when the actually new, uh, you know, the next update will be? For transportation data in particular? And, well, that was the example, I guess, transportation and points of interest. Right, so uh, what we're going to do is, um, you know, now that the new contract is here, we'll be working with our prime to have those, you know, conversations, the industry day to talk with vendors. And it's actually part of that contract uh, for the prime to establish, you know, COAs, you know, here's um, different possibilities. Uh, here's kind of the priority of those requirements. Uh, but then that will be briefed to the subcommittee. And we plan to convene the subcommittee as, in the January timeframe to take a first look at, um, you know, this inaugural year. Remember, this is all uh, a new process that we're standing up. We anticipate having uh, new data, at least on the federal side, available in March for that March cadence. But in terms of um, procurement and, and those things, this is a new process. So I, um, I don't wanna be uh, I'm overly specific on particular data products and when they would be available. All we can speak to for today is what's coming out in a few weeks in November, which includes the business points data. And then we'll have um, 
I know at least some federal updates in the March timeframe because we're going to that twice a year cadence. And beyond that, we'll just be communicating with you all on what the timeline looks like for new transportation data and like that. So it's not in the works um, for the immediate, you know, the interim, the first few months of this programming contract, but it's definitely a part of the bigger plan. I hope that's helpful. Okay, and while you were answering those questions, uh, others mm -hmm. popped up. I don't know uh, how much time uh, do we have. Uh, can we go through a couple more? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, so one question was asked about um, access to business impact data and uh, if we have any thought to include private industry data. I think uh, there's a business case. Uh, I would love to hear more about that business case. So that's something that I would encourage um, reaching out directly to me or the high field support team and we can set up a call and talk through um, exactly what that is. And, and then from there, we would take that business case and again, bring it to the subcommittee because it, it won't be the high field program just deciding what's a valid business case and what's not. We're going to have that wider subcommittee input onto those um, business cases and emerging requirements. So I recommend um, reaching out directly on that particular one. All right. Um, then there are, there are a couple of other questions and one suggestion. I'm going to start with the suggestion first. Um, uh, it's kind of a suggestion question. Um, are we also looking at getting data directly from state GIS offices, which have a process for aggregating data to state level <clears throat> from authoritative providers? Yes. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, question slash suggestion uh, for data sourcing. Yes. Absolutely. <clears throat> and we've been working, uh, we were able to send a representation to NISCIC this year. And that is the hope and the idea. I think we've got to find a way to be able to receive the data um, in some aggregate form in order for that to be viable. But we recognize that the richest data, the, the most highest quality is going to be at the state and local levels. And that um, states have come a long way in aggregating their own data and making it freely available in some cases. So that's definitely something we want to pursue and uh, look at. There's, there's so many um, good initiatives uh, so we, we have to remember to go, you know, step by step and make sure um, everything is set up to be sustainable going forward. But that's absolutely, I see that's from Allison, that's um, our, absolutely our intention <laughs> in, in the future. Hope that's helpful. All right. Um, and there is a question regarding support um, during, uh, you know, accessing support via his and, and Highfield and yeah. What is the best way for getting GI support? Knowledgeable GI support, I guess, is the underlying part of that question. Yeah, we understand that this is sort of a dispersed system, that there's um, a lot of different access points. There could be local network conditions that impact um, your user experience, but that's uh, something else that we've been tracking, um, especially uh, not just from a high field perspective, but from a, a wider GMO and OCIO perspective is how to improve uh, customer experience uh, with our portals. So um, I just recommend reaching out to the Highfield support team. That is the, the one and only way to reach the Highfield support team uh, just to help troubleshoot and, and look at those things. So we can definitely help with that. All right, and I think the last question you've answered um, already uh, about the cadence, so what we may not need to go over that. Um, maybe the person asking can go um, at the recording and, and listen to that part. Uh, how old is the current data set? And when was it last refreshed? Uh, be the last question and we move on. Okay. I wonder if that was for transportation data um, or if it was for the wider high-field inventory uh, it's in not, theory. It's not specified, okay. yeah, okay. Right, right. Yeah, if you're, um, regarding the high field inventory, there's a lot of variability. There's, uh, we have not um, published any updates since we froze the URLs earlier this year, but we have new data on tap and I'll actually talk about that in the next slide of uh, when those updates will be available to you. Uh, we are working with our federal data providers to get um, new data and um, we're already 
working with them and there's um, going to be some that you can anticipate in the March timeframe. So I'll leave that one there and we can talk more about the updates. All right, I guess uh, we can move on. Okay. All right, how, um, how about the next slide? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so just a quick note here about what the Highfield program is doing. So I mentioned a lot about the subcommittee and looking at requirements and prioritization, but then there's the, the scope of the program. So one thing that we're instituting is intake criteria. We're calling it our DSAR process. You don't have to worry about that acronym. It's a, a, it stands for data acceptance standard or, or data submission acceptance review. And that means that we have our own intake checklist. So when we're receiving new data, we're uh, preserving consistent information about each data layer going forward. And that will give us a better um, situational awareness of the high field inventory and the DSAR addresses metadata, addresses coverage, um, all sorts of things. So it's our way of, it's our internal data management process that we're instituting in the program. We're also establishing a workspace. Um, we're hoping in the future that might uh, support automated submission for data updates. And uh, that, that's something that we're looking to do. And then in terms of the deliveries, again, the twice per year updates and a very um, transparent submission workflow so that data providers aren't sort of guessing as to when new data is needed. They know what our cadence is and they can perhaps uh, work around that. Um, we'll provide all the guidance and communications that are needed. And we also recognize that there are options needed for disconnected systems and users. That's a future state requirement, uh, but it's uh, another thing that is on the list for um, the subcommittee to consider uh, avenues of meeting those requirements for users who need the data in a disconnected environment. And then of course, uh, we will continue our sustained outreach and engagement around the data. You'll see in a couple slides how to make sure that you're following Highfeld and, and on our list to receive all those updates and communications. And next slide. Okay, so here's the near term, our top priorities. First of all, we want to make sure that all the remaining updates that we received from NGA in their final um, active months are out and available to you. So we have those ready to be disseminated around the November 30 timeframe. So we, um, as a lot of you know, we uh, want to make sure our, our number one goal is to avoid untimely URL changes. So going forward, we're, we're going to be very proactive about anything that might impact uh, URLs. So, uh, and, and we're starting, you know, making this sort of a, an example of how we want to uh, be going forward. So for the first year, we're still going to support access to the legacy data from NGA. So we're not forcing anyone to make a change before they're really ready to. And this data from NGA is available in, in perpetuity for that regard. So we have flexibility there. Um, and then we recognize too that there are some duplication of services, especially on Highfield Open. This means that different users are connected to different versions of the same data layer. This is an issue that we're aware of, but we are hoping to address this issue once we lift the data freeze and provide you the guidance so that you can transition from your current URL to the new updated data layer and maintain that going forward. So that's our goal for this um, first round of updates. And the updates include 27 Oak Ridge data sets as well as I'm happy to announce here, the TransUnion Points of Interest data set. And then over on Highfield Secure, there will be Lightbox parcel data, uh, an update that will be available. So that's what we have on tap for you. It will be a new process in terms of uh, moving you to new URLs, and new URLs as appropriate, uh, but we'll provide plenty of guidance and even more webinars if we need to, to make sure everybody stays connected to the data. I'll just pause there and see if there are any questions on that point. Okay, and so um, I'll just restate here that we would 
open the uh, the year the transition time period for the data and allow people to switch to the new updated data, but then we would refreeze the URLs in the March time period and not do any additional updates until the following November. So that's our twice a year cycle. We're um, not causing any undue changes during hurricane and wildfire season, and that's the cadence we'll have going forward. So again, hey, Julie, we'll, um, yeah, go ahead. A question popped up regarding the ability to subscribe to get a notification when a data set gets updated. That's a great idea. And that that's what I mean by automation. Um, we I'm going to take that. <laughs> and that's that's the hope. Uh, we have migrated. Actually, it's, if there's no more questions here, um, then let's go to the next slide that has a little bit about the hub site. So we've transitioned from the Drupal based site that we had for many years to um, an Esri based hub site. And there is a lot more, uh, it's easier to manage in terms of those notifications and interaction. So um, that's a great idea. We do plan to have those notifications going out. So thank you very much for that. And so yeah, and, our uh, next to, Just ahead. to add, uh, the, the question also was uh, talking about potentially the, the notification having a summary of the changes uh, sent. So that's oh, also definitely. a good idea, yep. Yeah, and that goes back to the DSAR that submission process I mentioned, because uh, if we're capturing the, um, the updates in the intake process, then we have the content right there that we can include with those notifications. So it's all a big communications loop that's um, uh, wedded into the data management life cycle. So there's, um, it's a great thing about Highfield, it's, it's the geospatial data life cycle and strategic communications all mixed together. So um, we've got a, a great team and uh, the new contract and everything to support those new workflows. Any follow-ups there? Uh, not not for that point, but there's a couple of other uh, questions uh, if you want to tackle sure. them. Um, one uh, specifically talking about uh, uh, the business points and parcel data being updated. And the question is, would it be also good to update the transportation layers to keep the data sets in sync? Yeah, absolutely. And understood. Um, those are validated requirements. The subcommittee agreed last spring that these are things that should continue to be supported. So those are um, requirements that we need to get to. It's all a matter of priority. And so we'll um, be looking to the subcommittee in January to decide uh, what level of priority based on the age of the data, uh, what we've received, uh, what the options are. Um, it, it, that'll be the first decision for this new data life cycle that we're setting up with the new program. So absolutely. All and right, and then, then I, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you saw, you see, can you see the questions? <laughs> I just saw that one, but okay. that, yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't, you know, I don't have to read them to you if you see them. Right. I see this one. Okay. And great. no, you um, do not have to reapply for the credentials for the hub site. That's a public facing hub site. And so you should have no problem getting there. Um, you will need his and credentials to get to, um, for example, the data usage agreement that's a part of that site but there's guidance on the site um, to, to get you there if you haven't signed a DUA already. And if you have any issues accessing anything, please reach out to the Highfield support team. You can see the email address there on the page, the Highfield at hq.dhs.gov. Um, so that's uh, in terms of how you can get involved. I can, there's already a lot of active involvement um, with this audience here today. Um, but I just do want to foot stomp that high field inbox and also the hub site as um, some of the general guidance. Uh, we will be further developing this hub site for the data updates, um, eventually the notifications that we referred to. All the information will be there as we uh, continue to build it out. Um, we are really looking for those requirements. We're looking for use cases and we're bringing that all to the high field subcommittee um, for prioritization and understanding of the business cases around the requirements. And then uh, we'll also be at FedGIS in February. We should have a high field session as well as a booth. Uh, we also uh, plan to attend the National Fusion Center Association annual training, which takes place in April in Virginia, and then potentially UC. 
But the big dream would be to have an in-person feedback session like we used to have in the good old days um, next fall 2023. So we'll see if people are ready for that, what the venue might be. Um, that's something that we're going to try to do um, in, you know, in the best way possible. So that's our plan for, um, I'll just pause there, see if there's any questions. Okay. So you have the, the website here for Highfield and then the support team email address. And uh, let's just go to the next slide real quick. I did wanna bring it back to the GII and point out that we um, have been engaging with uh, Fusion Center uh, stakeholders to combine Highfield data and imagery services that you can get through the GII. And these are services that we coordinate with uh, DHS intelligence analysis, and also FEMA to make these images um, available to you, especially in response to an event. So this is something that's available on the GII, and I would just invite you to explore it um, more closely if you have time. And the next slide. And this is um, an example of our team. We were down in Arizona um, helping with um, Super Bowl support with Highfield and GMO services. And again, my email address and the Highfield email address. And I'll, I see there's a question. Yep. Yeah, will there be off cycle updates occur after major disasters with status of critical infrastructure? They are severely impacted. That's a, a really good question. I know we, uh, the main goal is not to disrupt the current data services. And so I'd like to hear more about that idea. I know that other entities provide that post-disaster imagery uh, that is available and can be blended with the data, uh, but that's a really good point. If the critical infrastructure is impacted, then that um, begs for an update. So um, that's a great question, great consideration. I mean, that's, that's the kind mm -hmm. of uh, data that we at CISA are uh, always looking for, and I can give you a, a quick anecdote here during uh, Hurricane Maria, you know, we were asked uh, from congressional staffers to provide updates on power restoration, and there was absolutely no data that we could find to, to get us that information, uh, power restoration, like in a, in a dynamic, in a live way. And one way we were able to do it was through a relationship with the, with the banking industry, we were able to get data of functioning ATMs, which we used to infer that if there is a functioning ATM at a certain location, there must be power. So we were able to infer where the power was being restored by analyzing uh, you know, ATM transaction data. And that was an interesting uh, way to do things. Uh, trouble is it took half a day or more to get the data, process the information and make that inference. Uh, and that, you know, is just not fast enough for emergency response. So we do need better data. Yeah, it's a great example. No, wonderful. Well, that's the extent of the updates we have for you today. I do hope that gives uh, a sense of where the new program is starting from, what our priorities are, what the approach is, but most importantly, how much we need the feedback and engagement and interaction with you as the, the users. So um, really hope to keep up this great communication and uh, we're here for any kind of questions or, or support you might need. Great, thanks, Julie. We have about 10 minutes left for any additional questions. So submit those via the Q&A if you still have them. And uh, <clears throat> this is Peter O'Rourke. I'm a little under the weather, so apologies for um, the way I probably sound. But just want to um, thank you to Julie and Kosti for um, taking the time. I think you guys know how important we feel the high build program is, and it is to both NAPSIG and what we do, but to our community. So um, we know it's a it's a really tough job what you guys are doing, and we're really grateful for your efforts. Um, and you know, as always, anything that NAPSIG 
and our partners like NISJIC, you know, we're happy to coordinate with any of the organizations to um, make your lives easier and, and give you the support you need to do this important mission. So, um, but most important, just thank you for the time you spent with us today. Oh, absolutely. This is great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And thank you everyone uh, that called in. All right. So um, just a quick call to action for everyone in the audience. Thanks to everyone who asked your questions. Um, if you think of something after the fact, uh, let the team know what you think. So as Julie mentioned on the website that currently exists, there's a big old button that says contact Highfeld and they want to hear from you. So um, they will monitor that and they will answer any questions that you come up with. But I also highly recommend everyone explore the data that currently exists. So it's always changing, always evolving, as they mentioned. So uh, it's really good to get in there and play with the actual data as you have a chance. I also wanted to mention that we just recently wrapped up the NAPSIC Foundation annual event called INSPIRE. It was at Oklahoma State University this year. Um, we're going to be putting all of the content from that event on our website, and it will include the keynote presentation, over 15 breakout sessions worth of content, and it also has links to our sandboxes, how-to videos, some really cool codes and scripts, and more. Um, Highfeld was also featured on our speed data in session, uh, which was a fun play on words and a really good session. Um, so really recommend everyone take a look at that content when it was up on the NAPSIC website. And I believe that is all we have today. So we will give you all back about 10 minutes of your time and appreciate you calling in to the NAPSIC Foundation Prep Tech Talk and be on the lookout for our next event. Have a great day, everyone.